work i represent an organization called climate trends and we work to communicate climate and its intersection with adjacent issues around uh, energy transport air quality environment and sustainable development uh, i'm very pleased uh, that we are able to host this uh, session today some of us have been at least trying in the media and the public uh, discourse to follow the g20 conversations uh, the last couple of months and as we draw close uh, to the leaders summit our intention for uh, this session is to essentially analyze how much uh, development or progress has been happening in the G20 uh, tracks when it comes to the two main uh, discussions that the G20 was focusing on, which is energy and finance. Uh, we saw at the meetings that concluded in Goa uh, in end of June and subsequently in the environment and climate ministers meeting uh, in Chennai, that there were a lot of uh, heated discussions despite India's well-intentioned uh, negotiating skills to try and progress, there were heated discussions on several contentious items like what happens to the language on fossil fuels, what happens to the state of scaling up of renewable energy, what happens to the crucial issue of finance that is so much needed for every country in the world to attain net zero, and especially the emerging economies that sit within the G20. Whilst on the one hand, uh, we all are witnessing how uh, either there are torrential rains or parts of the world are boiling and the climate crisis is coming front and center to a lot of countries across the world. But at the same time, just the ability to fast track finance, which is the central pillar and the central bone of contention, so to speak, has been uh, quite slow. There was the Bridgetown agenda, which was started by the Barbados uh, Prime Minister Mia Motley a couple of uh, years ago, landed uh, as a big summit in France. Uh, there was the BRICS meeting, which was not quite, not quite a high, climate was not quite a highlight of the BRICS meeting. But at the same time, BRICS as a bloc uh, is becoming quite strong, especially with the expansion that it is undergoing and how it is uh, becoming equally important in terms of the GDP share that's coming from BRICS as compared to others and so forth. Given, uh, I suppose, given the whole landscape that climate, energy, and the enabling means of implementation like finance really sit right in the middle of what sustainable development or transition will be for any of the economies, I think it's it's our way of trying to analyze in the few days that we have left, can we go a little over the line in terms of what the outcomes uh, can be from the G20 deal or how is it that we look at progress on, on issues around sustainable development, even between now uh, and the COP, uh, which is the COP28 to be hosted uh, in Dubai. That's the whole idea why we why we are here today. The flow of the session is uh, in two segments. In the first segment, uh, I have with me uh, my colleague uh, and the editor of uh, Carbon Copy, Shishan uh, Venkatesh. Sri will unpack for us how uh, the debate in media has been shaping up and how what kind of coverage the Indian presidency has been receiving in the Indian press and abroad what are the kind of issues uh, that are really being discussed by the press here and where do we think uh, there are there are areas where can be where we can have more opportunity at least in uh, the 10 days uh, that we have left after that i will uh, hand over uh, the mic to my colleague uh, and a senior journalist uh, archana choudhry and archana will be moderating the rest of uh, the panel uh, where where the where the experts uh, and speakers will mostly try and uh, unpack what the deal could be on finance why is it so important where are we sitting in terms of the big ticket items on climate action climate finance reforms needed in the multilateral development bank banks which have been uh, 
really top order in the last few months whenever we have spoken about uh, adequacy of capital that is needed to fund the transition uh, i'll let Ar archana explain more when when she comes uh, to that panel but i really do want to introduce our panelists uh, once and thank them uh, as well right, right at the outset uh, for joining us few people here uh, need very less introduction but i will do it uh, nonetheless we have uh, mr saurabh kumar here uh, we all know him as the ex boss of uh, energy efficiency services limited led a number of well known initiatives across the country driving energy efficiency goals is now the vice president at gap also known as the global energy alliance for people and planet which is uh, an alliance of a lot of uh, philanthropic organizations foundations trying to move uh, the agenda of energy transition in a way that it works for a lot of the countries including india thanks uh, very much mr sor kumar for joining us today we also have uh, with us uh, mr druba porkhaesta druba is the india director for climate policy uh, institute for as long as i've seen cpi's work uh, has not just been stellar but it's also quite important in feeding to what the government's thinking is on climate finance and we would hope to hear more from druba on what the opportunities or potential success uh, can even be for uh, for the g20 when it comes to india and and the ability to get something going on climate finance we have uh, webhav chaturvedi uh, with us uh, who's a fellow uh, at the council on energy environment and water cw also as we all know uh, is uh, quite closely uh, quite knowledgeable about what the climate policy indicators for india are where that is going has been giving a huge amount of input to the long term pathways and the and the net zero plans and hope to hear a little more from you web on the link between the g20 and the cop uh, which is another beast uh, in its own way and uh, we have with us uh, abhinav uh, jindal abhinav is a senior economist and faculty at ntpc school and uh, also very knowledgeable about energy transition just energy transition partnerships which were the flavor of the year at least last year when we were having the g20 in indonesia and will be nice to hear you know what happened to the to the jetp deals or or, or where they are they are really going uh thanks very much um, you know, on uh, on behalf of uh, the climate trends uh, group uh, to all the panelists uh, before i hand over to archna i first want to come to you shishan and ask a few questions on uh enough is happening in terms of g20 if you are based in delhi and uh, you step out a little bit as i did the last two days you can really feel that the g20 fever is coming right from the pots that are being uh, planted on the road side to new natraj statues that are being kept across in random locations it's quite uh, nice to see where uh, you know the g20 preparations are going but my question to you is where do you think india started we started a couple of months ago there was even talk of something like you wanted to do a green deal the conversations that happened in goa were very hard on language on fossil fuel uh, phase down the discussions that happened in chennai uh, you 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 attended uh, how do you unpack how media both in india as well as abroad are perceiving the role of the presidency and what india could achieve at the c20 thank you so much arti um so first of all i think it's important for us to remember what the g20 actually is um it's an intergovernmental forum of the largest um, economies in the world um and by itself it's not an elected body um so the the ambit of the g20 is to try and attain some kind of policy alignment between these uh, these largest economies um without without having to without you know um really deciding on individual pathways or specifics specific approaches themselves which are left to individual governments uh, as it suits their their jurisdiction their uh, country um having said that i think it's also a very this within this limitation it's a very important body because it it's it kind of is the only body that brings together very clearly 
the developed world and the developing world. And um, when we talk about collaborative climate action, uh, alignment between a uh, common understanding between these two blocks uh, has always been important and will continue to be important. Um, particularly in a, in a at a time like this, where in the past few years, of course, uh, nobody needs a reminder. We've had um, the COVID, then we've had um, the conflict in Ukraine. And over the past one and a half years or so, we've been, uh, it's like we've been moving towards this, uh, it's been a slow moving train, train wreck uh, in terms of the global econ economy. Um, and it seems to be just teetering and and uh, getting to a place where uh, where it will crash at some point. Um, so, put have, with this context, um, the this year's G20 summit was very was is a crucial one. Uh, it comes at a crucial juncture, and the Indian government definitely had the challenging you know uh, challenge to to try and build some common ground, try and build some uh, consensus around issues that primarily economic issues that, that affect the world. Um, and of late, as you, as you mentioned, um, climate and energy are a big part of this discussion. So this was, this was clear even for the Indian government itself to, to kind of showcase um, its growth in prominence and the world's world stage at the world stage. Uh, this, this, forum was seen as something very important and within that um india's priorities india's priority areas that that um, that we wanted to build some common ground around um the, as it pertains to climate where drr uh, that's disaster risk reduction um the climate and sustainability working group then there was a working group on energy transition all three of these were sherpa working groups which is uh, which basically um, means that the presidency decides that these are priorities. Uh, and within the finance group is a separate one, since, as I mentioned, this is primarily an economic grouping. So uh, within the finance working groups, there is a working group on sustainable finance as well. And over the past, since, um, since the beginning of the year, I think um, we've had about three or four meetings in each of these working groups, and um, depending on which group it is. Um, over the past month or so, the final meetings have have wound up, and we've received we've gotten the outcome documents. Um, I think I think around the world, um, media has primarily focused on the first part of what I said, which is that this is a this is a meeting where uh, two seemingly opposing blocks are are coming together, particularly in a very challenging situation, and um, for for whatever it's worth. Um, the disagreements around the situation in Ukraine and has dominated, uh, you know, the, the political discussion around this. Um, but if we, if we, you know, shift the focus back to climate um, and and decarbonization and energy transition, I think the government once again a, a lot of the lot of the questions, a lot of the circumstances that have changed over the past few years. Um, has been around supply chains, has been around the new energy economy, has been around the conventional um, uh, flows of energy and, and supplies. And um, given that, there have been certain certain um, certain lines, certain additions, certain parts of the of the document, some which have been included, some which have been left out, um, uh, having not been able to uh, build consensus around them. Uh, that that are crucial when we look at um, how the rest of the year might play out um, in in climate policy discourse and and what kind of what kind of bargains um, these different country groupings primarily let's for for just ease of understanding let's just keep it as developed and developing for now um, are going to be looking to uh, what, what kind of bargaining chips they're going to be looking to play. Um, Unfortunately, because because there is a very fundamental disagreement uh, around the security situation in the world, we have not had a communique yet. So there hasn't been a document that has been issued or, or been uh, released as a document that is fully consensual. Everyone has agreed on. Um, there are each document now we've, we've released outcome documents plus a chair summary 
uh, which kind of covers the, the the paragraphs or the the points in which there has been consensus, and as well as points where no consensus has been reached. Um, I think I think if we look at at this document, we should get a, a decent understanding of where where climate discourse, climate policy discourse is headed uh, going forward to the rest of the year, going to the COP. Um, so we can, uh, do you want to pick any of these um, to kind of talk about or should I should I just, you know, give a primer in some way? No, I wanted to, yes, you can. Uh, I also wanted to ask uh, the G, the BRICS got recently concluded. Uh, it's not a well-formed alliance like the G's, but you know the BRICS will compare to a G7 even in terms of GDP. So it's an important grouping. It's not as well-formed as the G's. It's expanded now. The choice of countries in the expansion uh, comes with a certain thought, but it's quite unique to have Egypt, Ethiopia, Saudi Arabia, UAE, uh, Iran, uh, and you can imagine where this is going. Uh, any thoughts, how, if you have seen, especially how the discourse has been covered in terms of the climate part in the BRICS, uh, looks like uh, it wasn't pretty exciting. And what does it mean then? The BRICS has met, climate was not the highlight, the responsibility is on G20 mostly to bring some discussion on climate, to link it to the COP28, or how is it going to play? Well, I don't uh, it's not clear whether expressly uh, the COP or or uh, the UNFCCC or climate itself has been uh, is is front and center in this decision to expand uh, expand the BRICS. Um, but it is very clear that four out of the six uh, countries that are that are being inducted next year are oil producing countries. So there's a clear shift, uh, at least in terms of you know trade of oil. Um, there's a clear attempt. To kind of move away from from pricing uh, oil in the dollar, uh, to try and diversify the currencies with which energy is is um, is bought and sold, um, and I think that is that is quite significant even when we look at it from a climate perspective. It gives us an uh, some sort of an idea that as far as the BRICS goes, they there is a good chance that that they speak in one voice um, when it comes to uh, language around uh, fossil fuels, when it comes to language around global peaking, um, when it comes to, uh, you know, expanding renewable energy, um, and also when it comes to, th this is a recent flashpoint that has that has come up over the past year or so, which is the CBAM, uh, trade policy and how it pertains to, to decarbonization. So uh, I think the, although expressly this is not, this is not uh, this has not been put up uh, put out as a reason for the expansion of the BRICS. The, this this expansion would not have been done had these alignment alignment in these areas not also been uh, you know met um, in that in that effort. Uh, this is this is how um, at least at the outset uh, it it seems to be going. Uh, the BRICS of course has its own has its own issues that it needs to deal with as well. Uh, there are questions over uh, the indebtedness of of uh, newer uh, countries that are going to join to China. Uh, how the how the power within the BRICS itself is going to uh, shift, or or how it's going to be expressed going forward. And I guess we will we will see how that how that evolves over time. Um, Shishan, we will wrap up in one minute. But uh, yeah, yeah, just just it, a final, it, yeah, yeah, just a final point. I think. It's also worth noting how enthusiastic the Indian presidency has been to try and bring the African Union on board into the G20. So this also has um, a bearing on what kind of language or what kind of approaches, uh, what kind of final targets could be agreed upon uh, moving forward in the in the G20, and uh, where where the Indian presidency wants to kind of push the G20s. Um, uh, G20's momentum, if you may, uh, but that's that's pretty much um, pretty much it. Perfect. Sorry to rush this a bit. I had one more question to you, but I'll hand it to Archana, and maybe she can bring in that question to the panelists as well as to you, which was on this whole thing of the 
language on fossil fuel phase out and for the climate campaigners at least this is so sacrosanct and uh, the the sense that people feel is that this is backsliding from what was already agreed in bali and maybe others can respond to this as well but this all this becomes just uh, you know the flashpoint of any kind of climate conversation and so did it uh, even in in goa when that language was not agreed but what was agreed in bali what happened to that fossil fuel phase down even if indonesia is committed to a fossil fuel phase down there is still apparently scope for gas and hardly any bring down of thermal power plants in the jet p deal itself which is 20 billion uh, or yeah but I i'll pause um, sorry to just put a lot of the moving pieces uh, like this here i'll hand it to you archana for uh, the rest of the conversation and you know let's see where we can find some common landing ground for where opportunities exist for the next couple of days thanks thanks so much arti and shishan this was really good thanks for bringing so many things into uh, the mix kind of uh, draw out the larger picture but i'd like to quickly go over to uh, our four panelists because we have quite a few questions for them but first just a couple of housekeeping rules very quickly i uh, would request uh, everyone to keep their answers to about 4 minutes uh, or there about so that we can uh, bring in more questions and uh, to those who are listening uh, please do put in all your questions into the chat and panelists in case uh, you would like to answer those uh, questions while you're waiting uh, to speak uh, in the chat itself you all are welcome to do that that would be really good too uh, so moving on my first question i think and i'll have all of you all kind of look at it just like shrishan narthi said uh, we've had multiple discussions we've had a g20 uh, um, we've had multiple meetings and we've not really had a communicate on uh, yet and then there is a shadow of ukraine and there is a us china uh, tensions in the midst of all this what do you realistically expect how do you see the leaders meet play out in so maybe i i would start with you mr saurav kumar and then maybe to uh, dhruba vaibhav and uh, then to you abhina if uh, each one of you all could take uh, three four minutes to just talk about how you, what your perception is so uh, thank uh, thank you arjuna um, uh, honestly uh, let, let me be very frank i am i've not been in the government i've not been uh, part of the g20 process from outside as well so it will be difficult for me to uh, guess but i, I but i think uh, on the political part it may be a different story but but uh, as far as climate is concerned i see a lot of convergence uh, in in whatever is being told yes i know on the fossil fuel language and and jet p there are still concerns but but i think larger issue of climate finance there is there seems to be some headway uh, i hope particularly if you if you look at uh, the the blended finance issues i don't know how much of it is getting covered under under the g20 but i know there have been reports uh, that were that were authored by uh, mr jens and i and others of the need for for a, uh, a blended finance structure all i can hope for is that given given what whatever we have seen so far of the g20 presidency in india i hope it's a big step as far as climate is concerned i know uh, the consensus on political issues will potentially elude this summit but but at least at least on the climate and particularly climate finance i i hope and wish that there is a big step up uh, on on the ambition and on the on the way uh, the, the 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 global south can be supported well hope and wish that sounds like a good way to go maybe i come to you dhruba what do you think how do you see what are you expecting the leader summit to come with, come up with you're on mute yeah thanks thanks good afternoon and thanks archana so in a in a similar vein on saying what is expected out of g20 and let me limit myself to the sustainable finance if you start with the objectives at which g20 started it had one objective of climate finance it had the second priority area they called it priority areas two was sdg finance and third was tap and it was called technical assistance capacity building i think that part is come out quite loud and clear what we cannot see g20 in isolation with whatever is happening otherwise 
which is to say the capital adequacy framework, the Bridgetown initiative. You have the Paris new global financial pact and all of it. Now, let me not, I don't have in four minutes, I can't get into each of them, but let me outline, which is what an alignment I expected to come is. The alignment around is three, four things. Alignment around MDB reforms is MDBs need to do more. MDBs need to <coughs> leverage their balance sheets more. MDB, a new financial architecture is required. Uh, MDBs need to address guarantees. So effectively, all of it ultimately boils down to some mechanism and they try and bring in RS, IMF also into the picture by recycling SDRs, which has been already a, a model in the reliance and sorry, resilience and sustainability trust. So some model is working. If you look at the outcome documents, actually the third outcome document is not there, but the outcome document for the governor's meet has been there for the central bank governors, they all tend to align around or aligned around the MDB financial architecture. And the again, I want to repeat that there are three things in that entire story. The three things in that entire story is MDBs need to do more. The how of it more, the MDBs, you need a new financial architecture for MDBs, you need recapitalization, you need them to address guarantees, you need them to address cost of capital, they need to leverage. All of them, all, all of them point out to the same thing. But what is missing? Now let me come to saying these principles are nothing new. So principles of Bridgetown, capital adequacy framework, global financial pact. If you look at the English in these pillars, they are pretty much well known and they were always there. What is possibly lacking is institutionalization of these concepts. That is still missing. If G20 could drive it, I cannot confirm if G20 can drive institutionalization, but there is an important point here. The important point is if you look at the triple agenda encasing committee report, that brings in the institutionalization approaches of these very underlying concepts of how is a third line going to get created? How is callable capital going to get reused more effectively? How is a risk guarantee institution or a possibly a risk mitigation, global risk mitigation facility could be addressed? And how is it that the World Bank and the MDBs could do more? So if you look at the triple agenda, what they have done is they've picked up the poverty reduction, shared prosperity, and they have brought in the concept of global public goods as a separate pillar and a thematic because the need for the MDBs have always been country. And since it is country, you cannot have a country coming in with a country strategy on a global public good. So they have separated this out of saying the MDBs need to address global public goods for which the nature of the global nature of the problem that we are in, it is not that every country can do it on its own. And let's get that very basic clear. You know, at the end of the day, if I have half a minute, I would, without a legal framework, which net zero does not have, you don't have a legal binding framework and therefore, there is an institutional requirement to address the problem. I think the triple agenda report given to G20 is directing itself towards that. I can speak more details, but I think- Oh, certainly. We'll we come now. back to you. We'll come back to you with more questions. We also have questions from the audience on uh, related to this. Uh, Vaibha, maybe you'd like to come in next. Great. Thank you, Archana. Very good afternoon to all. And thank you, Climate Trends, for inviting me. Um, so uh, in, in terms of the climate, uh, related developments at G20, uh, it's not going to be out of line as compared to what is happening on COPs, right? So we we knew what happened at Bonn, and of course, what is the expectation for the next COP? So it is going to be in line uh, with that. Uh, we recently did it as, and also, uh, I think some of the positions of these countries also are very evident in their long-term strategies, which were submitted to the United Nations, right? So it's very clear, and we published this report last week looking at long-term strategies of G20 nations which has already been there. And some very interesting things are very clear. Uh, this first big debate about this phase-out coal versus fossil phase-out phase-down. 
uh, and it's very interesting that out of the G20 regions, first of all, not that everybody has submitted their long-term strategy. Uh, I think 17 have, have done it. But out of these, only four regions uh, talk about a coal phase-out, which is, uh, you know, UK, France, Germany, uh, and European Union, they talk about coal phase-out. So it's not that even, uh, so that is about coal, but even fossil, only France talks about fossil phase-out, right? So it's not that within G20, even the developed north, there is a kind of agreement on these issues, as we know. And when you in include Global South, of course, there is a big disagreement between this coal versus fossil debate. And the uh, clearly developed world is not talking about fossil phase out. Even the long-term strategy very clearly show it. When we come to the other big high decibel issue of finance, you know, it's only five Global North members, Australia, France, Germany, Japan, and UK, who mention existing commitments or an intention to provide international climate finance to the Global South countries, right? So this is in their LTS itself, only five countries have been talking about others don't even talk about it very interestingly we we heard a john kerry statement recent statement right of course it was not about mitigation finance but he very clearly said about i think loss and damage finance something like that that us will not give a give a single penny to that but look at the, the 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 way the statement has been framed and positioned right and not even a single penny will be given to the loss and damage fund right so that's how the up, a very loud and clear position is uh, on other big issues which are actually not so big in g20 which are more COP kind of issues, like loss and damage, for example. Of course, they would be discussed, but they are very big COP issues, maybe not so much. G20, as Fuchan also said, more of an economic grouping. right? So uh, loss and damage, actually only two countries that India and Indonesia talk about loss and damage in their like long-term strategies. None of the other countries talk, talk about, even non, no other developing country talk about loss and damage. Uh, in climate risk, only eight countries mention the need for climate finance. There is no quantification even adaptation finance, right? Very, we don't actually know how much is needed. So that is always the first step, quantification, then you can ask for money and all that. Very clear kind of knowledge gap that exists there. Uh, and also capacity building, by and large, I think countries do agree. That is a, you know, uh, kind of a noble agenda. Nobody says no to capacity building. Even then, in terms of structurally looking at it, only 11 countries out of the G20 member countries talk about capacity building in their long-term strategies, right? But it is not such a contentious issue, you know, generally speaking. Uh, and so looking at all of these, it is very clear that even in the next COP, this whole debate on coal phase out, phase down and finance is going to be very, very loud. Loss and damage also. As I said, only two countries, India and Indonesia, mentioned loss and damage. Of course, you know, at COP level, there is a lot of other countries like African Union comes in. There's a lot of other support that comes in for loss and damage kind of agenda items. But at G20 level, you know, I mean, uh, COP is a different level of politics all, altogether. You know, I think I think last session which we it's climate trends organized. That's where we also discussed it. You know, and like it's like a same same politics is here. You know, G20 politics is here and COP politics is here. The so different level also. Even G20 countries we can't see agreement on these issues. Just imagine when we go to COP, what is going to happen uh, uh, to many of these? Even one big thing, new thing that came was clearly tripling of RE targets. That was something new. Even then, we couldn't agree because, of course, a, a developed world where growth rates are obviously very low and they have a large system. How can, I mean, practically, how can they agree to like tripling of RE? And India can agree, yeah, high growth rates, you know. How can this developed world, low growth rate country agree to tripling of RE in 10 years, something? So those are the interesting new things that have emerged. Uh, but of course, con uh, you, know, con you know, that uh, uh, consensus is far, even on those new items that have emerged. Uh, so let me just conclude by saying that I would be surprised if there is any surprise in the communique. Right? So that's why I'll just put it. I look forward to listening to all of you. <laughs> that's extremely uh, optimistic. <laughs> but I, I take your point, especially the bit that you've talked about on phase out, phase down uh, debate. And I think Abhinav, uh, I'd like to ask you to come in here and, and share your views because you're the person yeah. who understands it the best. Tell me, tell us. Thank you, Archana. Thank you, Arti. Thank you, Climate Trends. Uh, very good afternoon, warm good afternoon to all my colleagues and panelists. So, I mean, uh, Dhruva, Saurabh and Vevo have aptly pointed out what have been the hits and the misses, so to say, I mean, at G20. Uh, I, I would, I mean, obviously delve into that, but I, I just wanted to take a different kind of view of things. I mean, obviously, India is pretty much a part of it. India is driving discussions. I mean, but I would try to segregate it into now two halves. One is what G20 could have achieved or has achieved. And what are Indian objectives, Indian policy objectives. And probably, I mean, I think a fair share has already been uh, said about 
what were the hits or misses of G20. I would I would probably like to discuss more on what were the Indian objectives and whether if and how India has been able to articulate some of those objectives and what is the road forward now for India to take some of those uh, to a higher level, as we have pointed out, to COP28. I mean, so uh, we all know that there is a very, very clear uh, uh, line of thinking as far as uh, India, uh, India's opportunity uh, uh, in terms of China plus uh, uh, one strategy is concerned. Probably India has been now uh, very able, very clearly able to articulate that to a much wider audience. I mean, that was the first part. Uh, the need of financing, I mean, and the financing gaps have been uh, looming for long. India has been repeatedly uh, saying that at a number of forums, including G20, and probably at this juncture, it has been understood by all. Obviously, there is still a need to come down to a number. There are still we are still trying to work out the uh, the the most uh, uh, pertinent financial instruments that will help us transition going forward. There have been talks about jet fees. I can talk more on that. But but the broad idea is we will not. Uh, uh, go for uh, common but differentiated responsibilities in exchange for finance alone, right? So that is going to be the fundamental understanding of any financial mechanism that India agrees to going forward uh, in any of the discussions. And probably this is going to be a starting point for any negotiation for JetP going forward. And I mean, if you also see the JetP deals that have already been kind of gone ahead with a number of countries, South Africa, Indonesia and all, and if you break down, deconstruct them, we've done in a paper, if you see most of them don't talk about fossil fuel, uh, fuel phase out alone. And there are a number of other conditions, right? You would see some of those conditions impin sovereignty to some extent and probably India has pointed out to all the G20 countries this is not going to be the way forward. I understand I mean there was uh, a floating kind of a paper on JFT and I've been uh, privy to kind of some of those documents. I India has strongly resisted to some of the terms and conditions that were kind of uh, uh, asked on uh, the sovereign country in exchange of uh, a number of uh, fossil fuel uh, phase outs. Uh, and the phase downs. So probably India has, I think, leveraged G20 as a forum to its advantage to articulate this loud and clear. And obviously, I mean, if you talk about Atmanir Bharta has come out as a very, very important policy bedrock for India. India has been articulating it loud and clear in G20. And, and the fact that we are not uh, 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 sticking to battery storage alone, and we are also trying to highlight pump storage projects and a number of other storage projects to the larger community and the need for financing is also one of the ideas I wanted to say India has been able to make its point uh, to the G20 audience. And obviously, as Weber and others have pointed out, there may not be an agreement on many of these issues, but at least you've been able to point it out to a much larger audience. Yeah. Same is the case with a number of adaptation measures. Same is the case with the mission life that we have pointed out. India has stood its neck out. India has tried to articulate the point and there have been a few takers. There have been many non-takers. But the idea has gone out loud and clear. And probably in that sense, I would say there has been a, uh, a paradigm shift in the way G20 has been functioning in the recent past. And although, as, as uh, I mean, some of the panelists have pointed out, we will be surprised if there is any agreement going forward. But we should not be surprised if there is uh, any serious articulation of some of those ideas at larger forums. Probably. I, 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 at a very research level and at a very policy level, I see probably the voice of the South getting more and more uh, hearing, I mean, at a number of forums. Probably, I mean, at a very collective level, probably G20 uh, has, uh, although not a very coherent voice, but still uh, a voice which is being heard and probably which will even get stronger as we go ahead and move uh, towards COP28. And probably this is, I think, one of the key takeaways of uh, the entire exercise of this G20 that countries down south have been able to articulate led by India, I mean, going forward. And probably this is going to stand out uh, in the uh, next round of negotiations at COP28 as well. So I'll stop here. Uh, we have a number of things to discuss, but this is what I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you, Abhinav. So from what we are gathering, the bad news is that there's not much agreement on especially the phase out, phase down, uh, the 
old contentious issues stay. But there seems to be some headway that can be expected on discussions, at least on climate finance. So I'd like to come back to you again, Saurabh, because uh, when we to you had talked about MDB reforms and you talked about blended finance when you started. And maybe if you could go back and elaborate a little bit more on, uh, on that, and on how uh, more funding, uh, you know, can be brought in, especially given your uh, experience with public transportation, and how you know where the applications of this, uh, what can be the places where we can bring in more uh, finance or funding, if you could elaborate a little bit. Yeah, Arjuna. So let me let me begin by saying that this is an opportunity for India to show a different model to the world. Uh, what and and let me take half a minute to elaborate what I'm saying. If you look at the most successful uh, environmental uh, uh, agreement that has that has uh, worked in globally is the Montreal Protocol. Now, Montreal Protocol basically, from the funding perspective, was a simple grant capital coming from developed countries to developing countries so that they move away from HFCs and CFCs and whatnot. Now, my question is, that was a very specific uh, a, a, a few gases that you are dealing with. Now, when you look at climate, do you really think that the kind of money that is needed for decarbonization uh, in the world will 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 be able to come in that manner? So no. And therefore, the question of blended finance comes up. And I'll give you three examples where blended finance structures, very small amount of money has pulled in, crowded in billions of dollars of of private capital. And I'll start off by uh, with the Solar Energy Corporation of India example, which was initially started off as NTPC, NVVN, uh, uh, Power Purchase Agreement. But <clears throat> what did Seki do? Government of India put in 500 crores of, of, uh, of money to enable them to give guarantees, right? Also, it empowered Seki to dip into the state government finances if the PPAs with the third party uh, developers is not honored. What, have, what it has catalyzed in the last 10 years, more than $50 billion of investments in renewable energy sector. We did not have to go and say that, give me money. No, we did not. So again, government grant is like a blended capital. I'll give you the second example. The smart meter, I mean, uh, if you look at last 20 years, the government of India has been trying to reform distribution sector in electricity. Nothing really has worked. USAID put in a small bit of capital, maybe half a million, to develop a robust payment security mechanism and a model that is uh, not procurement of meters, but meter as a service. In the last 18 months alone, uh, 50 million smart meters have been, have been uh, bids have been finalized. Four billion dollars of private capital has been committed. Yet again, you have you did not need anything else. And my final uh, example is, uh, look at the public bus uh, um, uh, sector. There are about 200,000 electric buses in this country. Each electric bus cost about sorry 200,000 200, public buses in in the country. Just two percent is electric. Each bus cost about one point five to uh, to one point seven crores. Now, one way is to buy all these all these buses. The other way is how can we catalyze investments, private investment in the bus? So we are very uh, fortunate to be part of this whole exercise along with the U.S. government, and this also came into the PM Modi and President Biden's uh, joint statement that we as GAP and U.S. government will support the payment security mechanism that will uh, that will make sure 10,000 buses are on the road. Now, what has happened thereafter is that uh, the government of India has realized the potential of this blended finance. They are re uh, uh, enhancing this pool to 350 by by 350 million uh, uh, U.S. dollars, which means the entire thing will be about 500 million dollars. Now, catering to about 550,000 buses, and most importantly. One of the public sector entities called CESL, which has been doing this uh, bus work, is being empowered as SEKI. So, what I, what I, in the in conclusion, what I want to say is that it is not necessary that you need uh, grant capital to to decarbonize. You need blended capital, philanthropies, DFIs to come and governments to come and work together 
and so that you unlock the private sector capital because the real money to decarbonize, let's be very clear, is not with the government, it is with the private sector. And that's what needs to be unlocked. That's that's an interesting point. And yes, India is looking at these, so that, that point taken. But how can this be... Uh, how does this work in the G20 uh, framework? How can this be, uh, especially because this kind of segues into our uh, the question that I think one of our uh, listeners has also asked, Ruba, maybe you, uh, may, uh, this was specifically for you, so it would be great if you could come in. Be talking about, so the changes that then are required to bring in this finance, even pri private sector, or to bring in the, the talk about uh, reforming MDBs. Really, what do you have to say about realistically how that happens or can it happen you're on mute druga okay now archana that is crystal gazing question requirement of how political governments of taxpayers of g7 countries would react to i don't think i can hazard that very clearly but let me put down a few things together yeah. picking up from what rightly sort of said yeah. There is a potential for blended finance to unlock commercial finance and scale that up, the examples from India to rest of the developing world. And part of it, actually, ESL has been trying to do. So such models are available. The question is, the there needs to be blender over there. If everyone wants their money to be blended, yeah, And I have seen cases where MDBs want their money to be blended so that they can make higher returns. So philanthropy come in, de-risk me, so that multilateral development bank can make safer and higher return. And on top of that, you have preferred creditor status for them also. Yeah. So we need to unbundle this and make it very clear that in an equity position, you need capped returns for the blender and a debt position you need an inverted subordinate position to be taken by the blender and the scale required yes i completely agree with sort of this can be scaled up and these institutional mechanisms are required in terms of doing so but if we look at the magnitude let's go back to convergence report which is supposedly analytically one of the best ones available the amount is too small from what is required for mm -hmm. even energy transition. If they talk of some 220 billion of blended finance is not enough. Yeah. Realistically, MDB reforms, all I'm trying to say is, while in five years, it has been talking about the same three English phrases, I see we have to leverage public finance for commercial finance to come in. There is more use of guarantees. MDB needs to do more. But I don't think any of them, Bridgetown has come out with some mechanism, but they all in, end of the day need G7 taxpayer to commit something and which is not an easy political thing to do that for, for, for a lot of things it is. But the question here is that this report, particularly the triple agenda report, has brought in the global public goods and shown a mechanism in the third and the triple agenda that MDBs can be made to engage directly with the private sector, which has not been the case so far. So no one has attempted that institutional change or institution creation, facilitation. No one is open about creating new institutions even in India, if you say create another new institution, doesn't go well politically always. So therefore, there is a direction where the G20 will be able to lead this. It has got capital adequacy in it, higher risk taking in it, better use of callable capital, recapitalization of MDVs increasing. All of it is contingent on Global North agreeing to them in terms of, but having said that, the silver lining is, there is a mechanism proposed till now. No one had proposed that mechanism before the encasing Larry Summers triple agenda report. Mm. Thank you. Excellent, excellent points all. Uh, the, uh, this again, because we're talking about the fact that now the, the agenda report actually puts out that kind of, uh, uh, you know, shows a kind of path. 
there's also other parallel discussions that we were wondering how those, uh, you know, globally, for instance, uh, we'd earlier spoken about the Bridgetown Initiative also, and the fact that these changes need to be made, and that is obviously something everybody feels across. Uh, I mean, this is an idea that 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 is the finding resonance uh, elsewhere also and everywhere for that matter. But how do you see uh, that discussion affecting G twenty? Uh, you know, climate conversations. Do you see that affect? You know, having any uh, any resonance at all? No, uh, for for me. Sorry. Yeah, you and Vaibhav, maybe both of you all can take this. Okay, Vaibhav, will you go? I'll come. Yeah, I mean, this is also okay. Uh, let me say, I'm not really an expert on finance, but what is very clear, even if you look at Q and in this session, uh, that well, finance and agenda is is kind of a, become a paramount importance now in the uh, global climate discussion. And I think I recently wrote also that this is this has become the Achilles heel of climate negotiation process. It's very clear, right? I mean, it's fine to not have an agreement or disagreement on coal phase out, fossil phase down, whatever it is. Uh, but as Saurabh also said, very important comment that, I mean, it's about, we are talking about markets. Markets have to move, right? Markets have to move to for decarbonization to actually happen on ground. And for that, the increasing realization that finance is going to be critical for moving markets, right? So irrespective of the other 20 agenda items for COP, you know, L&D finance and coal phase out and anything else, uh, if we are not able to solve the finance issue in a very practical way. So it's great to see now the questions. So look at the question that we're asking now. You know, we're talking about blended finance. We're talking about the bridge town agenda. We're talking about some other common risk mitigation mechanism kind of structures, right? So the debate on finance has very clearly evolved from that, you know, that we don't, this $100 billion, uh, you know, ceiling or floor kind of high level number to something yeah. very, uh, very practical, very realistic, you know, in terms of actual measures that need to happen for finance to start flowing into the sectors that are needed, that need finance in the global south for decarbonization to happen. And so that's why I'll, I'll put it, it is clearly a actually deal of finance negotiation, the climate negotiation now. If we are not able to solve it, other 20 items don't matter so much. You know, this is the one item has become so important. Clear, clear action has to be you know, happening on these uh, on this front. Extremely valid point. Dhruva, you want to come in quickly? Uh, you, the, if the question is Bridgetown and subsequent, I, I, I see some form of convergence of Bridgetown initiative, the MDB capital adequacy framework report, the G20, all of it put together, keeping aside one important point the G20 probably will be able to drive in is finance for transition, which is what Weber was referring to. Because when you say green finance, green is like use of proceeds. So it is like saying reduction of emissions by fossil fuel intensive activity like steel is also a mitigation activity and needs to be supported because there has to be a class of directed finance and call it by transition finance or any name. I think that is gathered center stage from Bali to today, which mm -hmm. is which is coming out, uh, my sense is. How will that pan out subsequently versus the EU definitions for versus G20? We'll yet see the wordings, we don't know. But the conceptual part is reductions need to be incentivized and complemented possibly with the price of carbon because if you can't get that compliance and regulatory market of 6.2 and 6.4 working at least one of them working in that mechanism then what web have said is somebody how does the markets work because somebody has to pay for the incremental costs that we incur in decarbonizing a steel industry or any anything, even transport for that matter. So there has to be, now talking of Bridgetown initiative, the only thing which is probably the, the probably important is what on the loss and damage part, which Weber was also mentioned is about saying that here is a very perver perverted kind of a situation of highly indebted countries. And they are calling for restructuring of debt to highly indebted countries provided and also talking about a climate index of vulnerability, which then, which then proportionately shifts the allocation, which is one important part in terms of, and it is also uh, the 
alignment goes in. I think the Bridgetown in some way feeds into the wider MDB agenda, both of them. Whether G20 will be able to make them converge or make G7 versus G13 or wherever we want to make it, that is a political call and I won't hazard a guess, but the pathways are there to say that this is the way forward and therefore there has to be an alignment or else there is, well, all else, or else we should give up mitigation and concentrate on adaptation and resilience. That's that's a good answer. But uh, if I may come back, Saurav, I understand that you have to leave a little early for a meeting. There is a question for you from the audience before you leave. If you could quickly uh, take a look at it, because uh, it comes back to your point on blended finance. And uh, they were, the, our listener wants to know if uh, the entire developing world, if this, this concept can work the way it is working, it has started working for India for the rest of the world. Can you quickly answer that? So I've, I've already responded to that answer that yes, it can, for sure. The issues yeah. in, in India and in the much of the developing world uh, remain the same. Uh, so let, let's see what, what did Seki example do. It did three or four things. Number one, it created an institutional framework. Yeah. B, it created a contractual framework that, that was able to, to honor your power purchase agreement. C, it provided uh, the, the ability to make good of, of uh, you know, defaults through a financial mechanism. Now, these three, uh, if you just look at these three uh, uh, trades, if you apply it to, let's say, Nigeria, it there is no reason why this would not work. Mm -hmm. Let me very quickly, before I leave, come back to what Dhruva very rightly said, and, and that's where the carbon finance is very, very, uh, is, is not discussed as much as it should be. And whether it is Article 6 or whether it is uh, um, uh, voluntary carbon markets. Now, all over the world, we need storage solutions, right? For want of the fact that uh, pump storage plants will take their own time, these battery energy storage systems need to come into the grids as quickly as of yesterday. Now, today, the battery, uh, uh, the cost of batteries are prohibitive and there, there is no business model. But if there is a particular price of carbon that I can get, uh, which can which can then uh, make sure that my commercial viability of a battery storage solutions happen, I can start putting in batteries. And this this uh, country will need 50 gigawatt of of batteries by 2030, and at least three to four five hours of storage. Now this is not going to happen overnight. So I think what is needed quickly in this, I hope so, in this discussion, some sort of, 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 of uh, discussion on carbon markets, carbon prices for those very urgent uh, technologies that need to come into the system, maybe as of yesterday, can't wait for the battery prices to go down. And therefore, that is, I, I'm hoping that uh, there's some consensus that would come up maybe in G20 or in COP, etc. Uh, et et so that that's what I would, uh, want to say before I end. Let me thank Arjuna and also Arti for uh, inviting me. I, uh, I'll i be happy to be providing more answers if there are questions after I leave. Thank you very much. Thanks, all. Thanks so much. Meanwhile, if I can uh, come back to you, Abhinav, because uh, there is a question for you from one of our uh, listeners on uh, whether tripling of renewable capacity will be an issue because some of the G20 con con countries already have high achievements in this, this area. But if you could address this as well as uh, the uh, earlier point that you were making on, because now we are, we are in agreement, at least in this discussion, that climate finance is the main part of this uh, main uh, solution to our, our, to this conundrum. But, uh, Coming to the discussions itself in G20 also, not just in the COP, because you did mention about COP. What do you have to say about uh, the phase down, phase out debate, as well as this uh, question on renewable energy capacity? So, uh, I mean, Dhruva being a veteran, I mean, he's touched such a nice chord. I mean, he's moved us away from green finance to transition finance. I don't know. I mean, he's more privy to the discussions that are happening in G20 than myself. But if G20 is somewhat converging to the definition of transition finance, which itself, which itself is so loose, I mean, 
uh, for want of a better word, I'm using that word loose, but it has so many other connotations. Uh, uh, besides uh, helping transition an economy uh, to lower emissions, I mean, uh, in addition to the traditional definition of green finance, which is typically use of proceeds. So I, I, I mean, I mean that's a significant movement if that has happened in the G20, if that is so, and that is something which has to be kind of lauded. But even if there has not been a real convergence, but the pathway is clear, there has been a more and more acceptance of transition finance as an instrument in transitioning. I mean, although there have been caveats to the use of transition finance, uh, when it is carbon capture utilization and storage and certain other technologies, right? But but there has been a growing kind of understanding that transition finance is uh, the way forward for a number of coal dependent economies like India, Indonesia, South Africa going forward. So yes, I I would certainly agree with that. I would uh, uh, I I would say that probably there has to be a better articulation of this idea at the COP level also. I mean, India may find its voice. Uh, a, uh, a lonely voice, but with, with the help of a number of countries which have kind of found some acceptance at G20, this voice would become louder, stronger. So that is the first part. But, and as a Saurabh has pointed out, I remember meeting Saurabh at his office and he talked about why Seki tenders uh, for battery storage are not really taking off, particularly the RTC ones. And the biggest cause of this is the prohibitive cost of probably battery storage RTC, right, in Indian context. And there is probably a growing need to bring down those costs or to increase the value that battery storage services provide, right? And that is where the question of now concessional finance also gets in, besides transitional finance. And you can bring in this concessional finance, uh, obviously, uh, through a number of mechanisms, including the one that have, has been pointed out by the panelists cost of avoid, avoided carbon emissions, which relates seamlessly with the idea of carbon finance. We are seeing a nascent carbon market coming up. We are seeing internalization of carbon pricing happening in Indian context. Probably it has to be dovetailed with what is happening elsewhere. Although I'm not very sure how much of that was articulated at G20 level, but I strongly suggest if it was not, then going forward, probably India should try to work out ways and means towards instrumentalizing transition finance on the one hand and also along with carbon finance and uh, related carbon financing instruments to garner some of the financing right that can be met and not alone through grants and maybe a number of uh, blended capital and all the rest of it probably i mean yes the talk of blended capital is is really magical has been magical i mean so to say as far as uh, a few sectors in India is concerned and a number of other countries. But I would say India is peculiar in its context. It still has coal dependent assets. Probably, I mean, uh, financing the transition for some such coal dependent assets require a bit of carbon financing. And very easily, a large chunk of that can be done through pricing the cost of avoided carbon emissions. There are some studies happening. I'm also working out that. There are a number of other, I think Weber is also working on that, number of studies which are trying to work out the cost of carbon, which will be adequate to kind of compromise uh, the emissions that are happening from coal plants. But yes, we have a long way to go. But I think the idea going forward has to be the talk to be around blended capital as well as the transition finance and the carbon finance all going hand in hand. Interesting. So uh, now that we're looking at the different kinds of uh, solutions in within climate finance space that can or should should have been discussed or is probably being discussed on uh, at the G20, uh, one of the other one of the other questions that we had was on uh, and Vaibhav, Dhruva, both of you all please um, step in here. Uh, we were also trying to understand how the bilateral and multilateral deals that companies are I mean countries are looking at increasingly. We are seeing groupings like the IPEF. We are seeing groupings, uh, uh, you know, uh, internationally where there is obviously this China versus US uh, factor playing on uh, negotiations, international negotiations. How is that affecting negotiations at G20? And how will that also affect negotiations in the COP, do you think? Yeah, okay. So... Let me say that there's always a larger geopolitical background to any such negotiation, be it COP or be it G20. Right? So those things clearly 
clearly play out. And as I mean, as already Shishan also highlighted in the beginning itself, G20 is an economic forum. Uh, and one of the biggest sources of contention was this, uh, you know, language on Russia-Ukraine war, right? How do you position it in the communique? So, that, of course, it is front and center, those larger concerns and those positions on some of the most important issues of these times. And the dis disagreements on those, uh, you know, different point of views on those, uh, this kind of progress is clearly, uh, does clearly have an impact, right? But le let me also say, you know, coming to issues on COP and all that, uh, the question always is about are certain are are some countries going to gain some strategic advantages out of certain developments? You know that's how I'll put it. So uh, uh, on the on the development of like decarbonization, let's say, and if if RE becomes uh, one important element which is already being a part of the discussion, the second big element that is upcoming and some countries are clearly pushing for it is carbon capture and storage, right? So all the oil producing oil oil and gas producing nations. Why are they not talking about like renewable energy in a big way? Well, because their economies are tied in such a deep way uh, to their you know oil and gas business. That's their whole source of like big source of revenue and GDP for them. So now the term they are using is they are calling it circular carbon economy. And it's a formal phrase now. All these like you know UAE, Saudi Arabia, all of these countries are using this term very formally, circular carbon economy. And the argument is uh, we have to worry about carbon. Why are we? talking about, uh, you know, fossil fuel phase out. You know, we have to worry about carbon. And maybe at one point you can't disagree with them, right? Like, why are we talking about fossil fuel phase out? We need to keep carbon out of the atmosphere. And if CCS or the technology is able to do that, what should be our problem with that? Right? So that is the position they are taking. I don't know whether it's right or wrong, but I mean, on technical ground, nobody can disagree. You know, let's keep on using fossil as much as possible. Just ensure carbon does not come. Right. So now these are very interesting positions countries are taking and they are taking these positions based on, of course, their econ economic, you know, uh, I mean, strategic positions based on the economic uh, leverage they are going to derive or the imp economic importance of various outcomes, future outcomes for them. Right. So, of course, the China US war has got many, many different angles to it. You know, energy is probably one of those. Maybe there are many, many other angles, uh, to, you know, including resilience of supply chains, not just in energy on, I think, much more important issue, semiconductors, nothing related to climate at all, right? But this whole chip thing is a much more bigger thing, much more strategic thing. So uh, there are many, many different dimensions to it. I mean, uh, of course, the larger geopolitics is an important role to play here. But we are, what we are trying to understand here is what are the energy component of the geopolitics, not the semiconductor components, right? The energy component of the geopolitics. So, of course, in the energy component, this CCS comes in a very big way. Lithium supply chains come in a very big way. You know, many of those critical minerals come in a very big way. And that is where geopolitics does enter the discussion, you know, kind of heavily. Yeah. So. If you could talk about a little bit, because he's making an interesting point here. And that makes me wonder just exactly where does the G20 discussion stand on stand on these issues? And where should it be going in an ideal world? No, oh, thanks. Okay. So the earlier question was on these trade groupings and the political groupings. So I'm staying clear of that very clearly. The issue still remains global north and global south. So it is developing and develop OECD and emerging countries. So they they may be trade groups, they may be political groups. So climate is independent of that. For my my piece very clearly, it is the issue of and let's look at it very simply. If it is a global public good that needs to be public problem that needs to be solved, then it is an issue of how countries work supra sovereign, which is to say inter beyond the country is critical because if you look at solar investments in the world, you know, the sun if you take the radiation and if you take the potential multiply by the area, you will find it in the tropics, right? And quite commonsensically so. But if you look at solar investments, they are outside the tropics. They are happening in the developed world is outside. So you need to make this equation work. This equation needs to work differently. And for that, at some level, it is important 
And what is renewable energy or storage, as Sarah was saying? Renewable energy and storage is not fuel cost. It is just the cost of money. It's the cost of money. And therefore, in the IEA report and something which we have also put out in a disaggregated manner, CPI has put out a cost of capital across 40 odd countries. You can clearly see that the cost of money in these countries is much, much higher for the private investment than in OECD countries. And therefore, if you don't have a mechanism to socialize the cost of capital, and I would add, there is a need for socialization of information too, because if you, it's, a, it's a global issue and you need to socialize insurance for that matter, because increasingly you will not be able to transfer the risks of reinsurance to the country because the model was geographical sort of diversification. So you have a reinsurance problem, but notwithstanding all of that, the direction of G, if this is G20, there needs to be an alignment for sure. And that alignment towards supporting the, 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 the bits and pieces of all these initiatives, none of them, none of them on their own. There are all these movements have to somehow converge at COP. And if they don't converge and we don't see that, I, which is what Weber was also referring to, CRMM, call it by any other name, that's that's critical one, one part of it. Interesting point on saying that how CCS, so just the point to be added over here, but if you look at it, frankly, from India's point of view, coal gas is not very different from a natural gas, from what it does. So yes, so the, the whole point is, if gas is there and if it is gas out of coal, it is not, the word coal is not the problem. The word fossil fuel is, not, is the question of what carbon dioxide does. So let's focus on what carbon dioxide and how much carbon dioxide is going in rather than focusing on saying fossil fuels. Now fossil fuels can, carbon dioxide can be reduced with CCS, CCU. Those technologies could be there. Coal could be gasified and gas is a transition fuel in Europe for that matter. So gas is green, quote unquote. So do we have coal gas as green? We do not know. So I leave it there. Wow, that's a, that, that's a, that again brings me back then. It's a rabbit hole that we can go down a little more if that's okay with you, because <sighs> when you understand... I, I... Yeah, I, I, I'll have to end in five minutes, maybe, but. Uh. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'd like, uh, uh, I'd like Abhinav also to come in here and talk a little bit about this being an energy person. Uh, the points that Dhruba and Weber both have made when it comes to energy and India's role, especially given that uh, the presidency is with India. How, how are you seeing, uh, you know, uh, the points that they've made? How do they apply, uh, do you think, in your view? I mean, uh, I, I totally agree with what Dhruva is saying. I mean, it's 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 the larger debate is between the global north and the global south. Uh, all the uh, aggregations and even disaggregations at time uh, are, uh, if you see, going in a way that direction only towards. Uh, so the voices of the south. If you talk about an organization like ISA, so ISA, I mean. We, we, we are seeing India leading, uh, I mean, uh, an organization like ISA in terms of installing solar and renewable capacity across a number of countries. So the idea here is India being a flag bearer for a countries, uh, for a huge number of countries in the ISA region. But that uh, in no way kind of digresses the uh, overall debate, which is the need for financing for these countries, right? So probably I don't see there is any dichotomy between uh, the groupings as such and the subgrouping, so to say, probably I would say that uh, many, many a times these groupings are uh, making the voice uh, even louder. And, and but, but if you see the larger point, here the groupings are enabling development of capacity uh, amongst each other, uh, number one. Number two, they also help us uh, in kind of appreciating that uh, th there is, uh, if not a larger consensus, but at least uh, there are there are uh, pockets of consensus, and and uh, going forward, this is going to uh, uh, be uh, a positive sign for discussions. That is the first part. Now the second part is, uh, I mean, again the contentious part. 
the use of coal in the entire uh, gamut of uh, negotiations climate negotiations whether uh, use of ccs tant amounts to uh, withdrawing so called the use of coal and what is really the path forward and i would see a bit i mean i mean let us let us uh, bring a bit of pragmatism to the entire climate negotiations debate i mean we can't uh, uh, we can't paint the whole uh, wall black by a singular brush here all countries have their own priorities they have their own sets of energy needs each country has transitioned Uh, or is looking to transition in its own um, manner india being a coal dependent economy will need some bit of a reliance on coal going forward being net zero will uh, 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 for a power sector also will require us to have emission abatement technology be it ccus or be it uh, uh, fgd so i mean we should not shy away from the use of coal so to say as long as we are doing a fair bit of things when it comes to emissions abatement right that is one part now the use of ccus alone if you see i mean in ccus the expensive part is storage and 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 the part which relates to security also is storage so probably i don't know i mean i will not be able to comment on my role in ntpc here but if you see most most of the research in indian context is pointing towards the use, use of ccu uh, vis a vis the use of ccus it not only uh, reduces the cost significantly but probably is more viable for an economy like india so uh, the point i'm trying to make is probably our own transition path will be unique and india is trying to articulate that we may not shy away from articulating that going forward if you see a number of studies in indian context are still not uh, 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 pointing towards the higher feasibility of ccu in indian context as of now as they are doing for batteries i mean so to say so probably we are still trying to evaluate at which stage ccu should come in given we don't have access to blended capital and foreign capital for that so i would say that uh, uh, the the negotiations uh, india has is 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 doing its fair bit in terms of making its argument loud and clear in that direction interesting since we have been talking about carbon my colleague shrishan has a very interesting question on this and uh, the, he's asking if we focus on carbon wouldn't it bring the focus on the need for a global peaking year and all the complications that come with that what do you have to say weber yeah yeah so this is the discussion this is an ongoing discussion right global peaking year right see i think let, let me put it this way uh, uh european union let's say it's a, a very super ambitious right whatever they are doing also in the near term because of the war have gone back to coal gas and fossil not withstanding that they understand that these these are very short term things and they are really committed to whatever they have said like 2050 net zero and whatever some other countries have said 25 45 and all that they are very very committed to the idea right they they take the climate issue as one of the highest importance that's what they are giving it right so now what they are doing is they are trying to figure out many many different ways right one is this global let's say the first push was 1.5 degrees right not everybody accepted it so the language we chose was well below 2 degree c with efforts to move towards 1.5 degree so that is like compromise language right now the, okay this is still a very high level language right now the question is how do you start you know giving some more color some more structure some more nuts and bolts to, the, to for whichever way possible like whichever way possible literally whichever way possible means could it be tripling of renewable energy you know could it be fossil like coal phase out fossil fuel phase out you know could it be global peaking year you know whichever way right but ultimately uh, they are simply you know they coming up with so many different things so many different ways not that all of these are uh, kind of uh, alternatives to each other necessary some are complementary some are overlapping you know anything but the point is all of these collectively and anything could work you know these are kind of parallel discussions happening and you attain certain progress on all of these parallel discussions but the ultimate goal like your message is that we have to be a lot more ambitious right because climate is a real problem so of course if we focus on carbon it will be global peaking year if we focus on energy like that the sectoral level there is also discussion on sectoral targets right so it's peaking is only one thing the discussion isn't that is that less contentious not at all it is equally contentious right talking about uh, a net net zero power sector by 2035 
right? Equally contentious, obviously. So, irrespective of whichever way we kind of cut and dice it, uh, the background is very clear that it is a lot of push coming for making action more ambitious. And whichever variable we choose, each variable is equally kind of tough, equally complicated. And there are big differences of opinion on each and any variable we take in this climate debate as far as enhancing the ambitions in, is concerned. Ruba? No. Uh, sorry. Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Because uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the technical part of global peaking is not what my area of work is. But I can I can address the problem in saying, if you say there has to be a global peaking year, yeah, probably yes, probably there would be a global peaking year. But I but I I I don't get. Okay, I have not fundamentally got net zero at the first place, so I am not even clear on this net zero, the possibility of net zero, because it looks. Personally, it looks shaky in a way of how I put it, that there is no mechanism. Let us imagine that in a room, there are 10 people who, who today weigh 1000 kg. And you are giving them a target to come down to 500 kg. But no one has any communication or no control or a no framework of legal of what one can do and what one cannot do. Do you really think that will be achieved? Yeah. That is how the net zero framework is. Now, you talk of transition planning. So, so, so in this kind of a situation, you probably need a law to come in somewhere, a law at the country level. And I guess India does have a net zero bill. You need law to come in in terms of directing economic agents towards that. Those economic agents may be public and private. Whether it leads to a global peaking, but the efforts towards it points to a direction. Projections require a global peaking for sure. Yeah, projections do require a global peaking. But the constraints on technology, scale. So it remains three things. It remains money. It remains information. It remains technology. Now you can bring in three parts of all of these together into one unified climate. If G20 can do that part of creating a climate institution at an international or a global level or put an institution together, stitch together, maybe yes. But all of that, all these bits and pieces of Bridgetown, capital adequacy framework, new global financial pact, all of them, G20, G7, which was there concluded, all of them need to converge at COP or maybe at annual meetings, which I would not know. At some point of time, they need to converge into some action plan. Thanks. Thanks so much, Zuba, because you're making a very important point and also it it, it ties in with uh, what we've been hearing uh, in the in the. And in the press, we've been hearing whispers from the government about, uh, I know that there were at least two, three stories that came out a few months back on a green deal, on a possible green deal uh, that India was trying to uh, work on. Could creating an institution yes, for yeah. climate, considering the kind of difficulty that there is on converging on so many different uh, issues and there are so many different uh, balls up in the air, do you think that that could be one of the wins that India can claim yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me come in here. On the Green Deal part, let's understand that there is climate, but there is SDG 2. When we deal with this problem, there is an SDG pillar and they are not always aligned. You mm -hmm. will need an issue where it is some sort of a trilemma between health, education, environment. So so when we look at SDG and sustainability versus climate, it's not that they are not always aligned. They are not always aligned. So therefore, we would need a thought process around financing sustainable development and financing climate. So mm -hmm. now, financing SDG 13 versus, I am not putting one against the other, but the priorities 
global priorities are defined by where one, two, three, four sit versus where SDG 13 sits. I suppose at some point of time it is 13 and they are one, two, three. So you can't have them one pit against the other. And therefore you need new day pathway where 13 is met, but at the same time the rest taken care of. And that's what sustainable financing or SDG financing needs to direct itself to. Notwithstanding the fact that climate is a time contextual sensitive problem which needs to be addressed by 2030, 2032 for sure. And therefore there is money, there is technology, there is, yeah, I would say a lot of technology has got to do with trade barriers as you yourself brought in CBAM into it. So yeah, the other institutions also need al alignment between WPO and SDG 13 goals. So that can get probably get into the platform at G20 or at on annual meetings. We will wait to see that. Yeah, we will indeed. Vaibhav, your thoughts on this? Um, yeah. Yeah. Sure. So, I mean, I think Abhinav also wants to say something. I just want to probably we are uh, running behind time. Uh, I, I'll, yeah, sorry. So maybe uh, Abhinav, you do you want to make a point uh, just after Abhinav says his piece. Abhinav, please come in. Yeah, I just wanted to say one thing when Bebo, when uh, Dhruva mentioned something about the uh, the so-called Green Deal. Of it. Ever since, I mean, we had the IRA in US and EU Green Deal and probably there are talks about some kind of a fiscal kind of a deal in Indian context also. I just wanted to say, and probably, I mean, it has been talked about, but it has not been spoken here. We probably also need to work out the green taxonomy in Indian context before we come out with a mega deal, such as a green deal. And probably all these things have to be talked synonymously going forward. Otherwise, I mean, we will be putting the card before the horse. I just wanted to point that out. Excellent point. Excellent point. Yes, Vaibhav. Yes. So I think I'll just quickly respond to a question that was that was uh, there, which is about lack of consensus agreement in G20. Is it worrisome? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I, I think uh, there, there's not, uh, if we look at the climate discussion, right, bond G20 and coming COP, earlier COP and all those, there are no surprises yeah. that have been thrown to us, right? So in that sense, of course, it is generally speaking, it all is worrisome if there is no discussion on like progress, meaningful real progress on finance, at least one aspect I would say. But there is nothing like uh, no surprises at all, uh, which has come out of this discussion also. Same things have been carrying for, carried forward. Some progress has definitely happened on finance, which is great, but not as much as what we, do, we would have liked. But the final point, I want to say that uh, if, if I look at all any of these negotiation process, right, these are super slow, we know that. So, but why do these matter? They matter because many times, even if there's, there's no deal, like it's like there is nothing that all countries sign on to formally still there is a, a good enough a market signal which pushes markets to move in a particular direction in the direction which which we want from the climate perspective right so it doesn't matter if countries have signed in the markets have moved in that direction uh, which is a great thing so when countries sign on to a deal that is not there is no policy signal that is as powerful as that mm -hmm. right so that is the strongest form of policy signal one can say even if countries don't sign to it Still, there are enough, uh, you know, signals to the market, right? Weak, maybe at times, you know, is strong, not as strong as the perfect, you know, all countries have signed kind of signal, but it's strong enough for markets to act. That is already happening. Markets are acting. It's very clear. The question is now and not at all about where directions have changed or not. Direction has changed, right? All the markets, energy markets are moving in the direction which they should. Uh, the question we are talking about is accelerating the pace of action. Right. So now what kind of signals are there that will accelerate the pace of action for us to achieve uh, the climate targets as early as possible. Right. And that is why uh, now uh, the finance question becomes very important because it is all about accelerating the pace of that transition. Uh, and that's why it doesn't matter if you coal phase out, fossil phase out, uh, you know, that writing is anyways clear. Right. In some countries, it is different. For example, Indian banks might still be lending for uh, two coal power plants. Right. So because within the country, the policy signal might be energy security is more important. Yeah, We are, as of now, not ready for getting out of coal because of energy security concerns, right? Now, that is also a very important policy signal that Indian banks are looking at and or might be looking at if that is the position, right? Or maybe if the policy signal is don't invest in that direction, that is how banks will act, right? So more than the signing on the dotted line, it is the signals and the strength of the signal 
uh, is what really matters from the perspective of long-term transition. And finance is something that goes beyond signal. It is about operational. So operational nature, that's why we are trying to solve for that operational things where we are stuck as a, from the finance perspective. And some other things will continue to emerge, which are, you know, on, on both, on signals as well as these operations that we'll have to simultaneously keep on solving for accelerating the transition process. Excellent. I just want to make one point, Archana, on the clean energy ministerial on the sidelines in this G20. If you look at the outcome document signed up, yeah, uh, there is a bit of a confusion in that. But if it is, I do not know whether it is uh, to be done. If you notice it, it has been written as at reaching carbon neutrality slash net zero. So all of us know that these are two different terms mean two different things. Yeah. And therefore, focuses on energy independence, energy security, acknowledges the need to reduce emissions towards carbon neutrality slash net zero. I'm not sure, but no one, no confirmation on this. But if I were to use these terminologies, yeah. They are not the same. Now, does it mean we are back to carbon neutrality or carbon net zero as a pathway still remains valid and good? But if the agreement is on carbon neutrality, it may mean some difference. Thanks. Thanks for that. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Uh, we are on the hour as uh, we've crossed uh, the time that we will be at plan to take. But this discussion was so interesting and there's so much now more that we can, we know what to look for and especially uh, the advice that by, that you guys have given on following the money, the money track, which is the most important one in, the res in solving this, uh, uh, in understanding where the G20 will be headed. But we'll all be looking forward to what the outcome of the G20 uh, uh, meetings are. And uh, and we may we will come back to you to help us understand once the event takes place and before the COP. I hope we will be able to see you, uh, welcome you back again for our next discussion. Thank you so much for making the time. Thanks a lot, Aarti, Shrishan, Rubav, Vaibhav, Abhinav. Thank you so much for making the time. Thanks, Thanks so everyone. Much. And if there are any unanswered questions, we'll be in touch and send the responses in writing. Absolutely. Thanks very much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.